Welcome to the premiere of Sunday Stories. I'm Michael Sanford. KVIE is celebrating 60 years of service to our community. And over the next hour, we'll be sharing stories that celebrate the rich history, amazing people, and fascinating places throughout our region and beyond. It isn't every day that PBS's highest rated ongoing primetime series pays Sacramento a visit. In fact, the last time Antiques Roadshow rolled into town was the year 2000, 19 years ago. But they returned to the capital city earlier this year, and we sat down for a behind the scenes interview with executive producer, Marsha Bemko. You know, my hopes for the show are always that, first of all, all the people who come tomorrow have a good day. Never mind what we're capturing. I want people to have a good time. I want them to learn something. Then I'm a TV producer and I get a little ruthless. <laughs> I want really good things to come, but not just valuable things, good stories. The story is king here. The story is king at the Antiques Roadshow. As thousands of people move through these lines, appraisers are on the lookout for hidden gems, the fascinating stories, and the one-of-a-kind artifacts that might make it to air. Then, a look at the historic efforts to save and restore NASA's mission control. It's important for people to see what it took for us to put man on the moon. The very tools that got us to the moon are being brought back to life. These are the historic mission control consoles from Building 30 down in Houston. If anybody has seen the movie Apollo 13 and you see the room that the film takes place in, these are the actual consoles from that room. Here in Hutchinson, Kansas, just outside Wichita, a unique team of engineers and craftsmen is rebuilding the control consoles that sent Apollo to the moon. And later, Amy Seiward, artistic director of the Sacramento Ballet, in her own words. There are things on the planet that are difficult to put into words. And to me, dance and music can fill the spaces that sometimes words cannot. What I want to do is to challenge people's preconceptions of what ballet is. A mother-daughter duo sharing laughs while running a business together. Sacramento's historical connection to the Transcontinental Railroad. A program to get students to eat healthier in school. Something from our archives, sure to bring back fond memories for longtime viewers. And a first look at KVIE's other new series, The Journey. Do you have something around your house you think might be a valuable antique, like a 1914 Victrola or Victrola, believe it or not, both pronunciations are correct. Either way, have you ever wondered what it might be worth? Well, you're not alone. Nearly 2,000 people brought items to be appraised when Antiques Roadshow returned to Sacramento this past May. We were given exclusive behind the scenes access the day before production. And Rob Stewart sat down with executive producer Marsha Bemko to talk about coming back to Sacramento, recent changes to the series, and how they pick and pitch the most interesting finds. If you love Antiques Roadshow, and let's face it, who doesn't, it is the most popular PBS primetime television show, then you're going to love this person right here, Marsha Bimco, is the executive producer, and it is her baby. My baby. Yes, it is. Yeah. Good to see you, Marsha. Good to be here. Thank you for taking time to be with us, and welcome to Sacramento again. Welcome back. I love it. I love being here. It's been 20 years. It's been 20 years. We last taped here in 2000, season five. So yeah. It's been a long time. 19 years. Wow, see, that's yeah. 19 okay, years. Okay, 19 years, yep. So we are in the Crocker Art Museum, and I love the changes that you have made on the show, away from convention centers, yeah. and now we are surrounded by a foundation of even more history. Yeah. 
It's been such a nice change for us because the last time we were here, we did it from your convention center here in Sacramento, which was great. It, it, it provides a lot of things. It's a very handy way to do the show. It holds a lot of people. But what you end up happening is it's not the same kind of sizzle and excitement you get when you plop yourself into the environment in a place where you get a real sense of place from the spot we're doing the show from. You are all over the country. And I'm curious what you think about Sacramento and the Northern California region in comparison to other places. I could move here. Really? And I wouldn't say that about comparison to other places, but I could live here, I Why? like it here. I love the, the friendliness of the atmosphere. I love the weather. What were your hopes for the show? You know, my hopes for the show are always that, first of all, all the people who come tomorrow have a good day. Never mind what we're capturing. I want people to have a good time. I want them to learn something. Then I'm a TV producer, and I get a little ruthless. <laughs> I want really good things to come, but not just valuable things, good stories. The story is king here. The story is king at the Antiques Roadshow. As thousands of people move through these lines, appraisers are on the lookout for hidden gems, fascinating stories, and the one-of-a-kind artifacts that might make it to air. Sir, tell me your story. Uh, this is a painting that's uh, found on the wall uh, in the shack that I live in Bangkok. Once an appraiser finds an item that might be show-worthy, they call over a senior producer for what's called the pitch. How do the pitches work when someone <laughs> comes to you and they've had their poker face mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. the appraisers, and they come to you and say, Marsha, Marsha, yeah. Marsha, Marsha, we've got it. So how it works, like from the very beginning, let's say you come in with a vase, okay? Your vase is probably like most of the other people's vases. And so what you're gonna hear is this. You have a vase, it was made circa 1950. It's made in America, probably in Ohio. And um, it's worth about $50. Do you have any other questions? And you're done. And you ask any other questions. I don't know what you might have about that vase, but you may have them. Now, you bring in a vase. It's better than that one. And what the expert will say to you is, do you mind waiting for a producer? That's when the pitch happens. So that guest waits for me or Sam or Jill to come and listen to the appraiser will pitch us. It's very rare. Yeah. I haven't, frankly, seen one. He's going to pitch this thing like, or she, like a mad bunny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like a mad bunny. Here's why. The return on their investment for being here tomorrow is that they get at least taped so they can make an episode of television. How did you get this clock? Well, I inherited it from my father. Okay. Marcia allowed KBIE to film her during a pitch. It's a behind the scenes moment that's rarely seen by viewers. But it moves a ball down this track. Oh, wow. And the weight of the ball pushes down here. Marcia is talking to Tom whose family has owned this remarkable antique clock since 1895. He doesn't know yet what the appraisers have to say about this clock because the producers want to keep it a surprise. What's happening is you have caught me in the middle of interviewing the guest and I have just decided to tape him. And I am getting ready to put him in the process to go to the green room where he will learn about this item that's been in his family for quite a while. How nice. I'm excited for him. I'm excited for him to learn. But I can't tell you more now because he's sitting right next to us. Tom heads off to the green room, and a few hours later, he's up. He brings his clock to a multi-camera setup to be taped for the show. Now, we were not allowed to record audio during this portion. But just look and see what goes into filming a segment like this for air. We caught up with Tom after the taping to ask about his experience. Well, it was fun talking about that clock. I hadn't thought a lot about it in many years. I walked by it and looked at it, but uh, I put it on that table and without even leveling it, I managed to get it running and it ran well. And it's kind of exciting to me to see that clock run. Did you get a year on it or how old it could be? Yeah, he thought it was uh, in the 1880s. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Did he put a value on it? 
He said retail for 15000 What do you think about that? Well, I, I thought that was about right. <laughs> but you guessed well. But, but it's not for sale. You know, I, I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but I'm certainly not going to sell it to anybody. Just because an item is taped for the show doesn't necessarily mean it'll end up on air. Marsha takes the footage of the appraisals back home with her and grades each one, ultimately deciding on the best stories. Then there's a fact-checking process to make sure no mistakes make it on the show. The best of Sacramento will be divvied up into three one-hour episodes. We will tape multi-cam segments, single camera segments, staff shots with the single camera, some digital segments. Out of all those things together, we'll tape about 150 elements we'll go back with. Oh, wow. To make the three episodes, to, to use digital material for digital as well. Now that's 150 people who got taped out of the several thousand who came. So they better have a good experience because that is their day. They came to learn about the two most precious things in their home often and they want to go out with more information. And by the way, it's usually not for a lot of value. <laughs> and from their favorite yeah, TV show. I know. From their favorite TV I show know. though. I know, but they do learn something. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is, that is very rewarding for us and I hope for them. I find Antiques Roadshow to be a period when I watch it as a viewer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where I am learning without even knowing it. It's and so I'm learning so much other than what we're talking about. <laughs> it's so true and it's a, you learn it with a spoonful of sugar. What I like about Roadshow is you don't notice your learning. So it doesn't feel like a lesson. I don't feel like I'm sitting down to, it's time to learn this. If you watch a season of Roadshow and you don't learn when the Civil War happened, what were you doing? There's no way you're not going to learn that because so much that we see on the show was made in those years, 61 to 65. Before we wrap up, I just I want to say I want to thank you for what you do personally as a viewer yeah. um, and a fan because anytime I'm homesick, anytime I miss my grandparents who are gone, I can turn on your show and connect with the sweet spot in me. And you are um, your free therapy. You know. <laughs> That okay. is like the, so one of the nicest things everyone has ever said to me. And I mean it. Well, thank you. And my therapy is Tuesday mornings when I get the ratings. I want everybody watching. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Well, we have a little gift for you for when the ratings come in on Tuesday <laughs> after the Sacramento show oh. airs, which will be top-notch ratings. Yes. I can promise you that. Um, we have a KVIE t-shirt for Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I, let me show you it on me. Well, I'm not taking my clothes off here, people. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. That okay? looks fantastic. Black and me with a colorful KVIE. Now it's give working. it an evaluation. What's it worth? Oh, this is priceless, babe. <laughs> oh, good. We priceless. like that. We like that a yeah. lot. Yep. And so are you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a, what a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Here at the Crocker with the executive producer of Antiques Roadshow, Marsha Mimko. Any secrets you can give away because you hold all of the secrets. You know all about the show. And as you know, you're the top show on PBS. So give us something. A secret. Hmm. Well, I don't know if it's so much a secret, but most of the people who are here today have J-U-N-Q-U-E. <laughs> Is that a secret? <laughs> Maybe not so much. <laughs> but I like the way you spelled it. I just want to be respectful. It's, it's, it's junk with a flair. <laughs> junk with a flair. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right, I love that. Girl power yeah, all girl the way. Power What's your hashtag again? Hashtag girl power. Hashtag antiques roadshow too. That, there you go, both. All right, thank you. Thank you. A bit later, Sacramento's pivotal role in the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. But first, our next story highlights some of the unique challenges that come with being part of a family business. We meet mother-daughter entrepreneurs who are keeping things fun and delicious, all while creating new memories together, one scone at a time. Well, I have to admit, she's my daughter. You waking me up at 12.30 again? Oh, I'm waking up at 3. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I have to admit, she's my mom. You ready? No. <laughs> that's Kate. And that's Elle. And, and we're, we're two ladies, ladies and a scum. We're like uh, olive oil and balsamic. We're good together, mm -hmm. but then at times we separate. Right. But if you don't put them together, it's no good. <laughs> yeah. So who's in charge of this business? How's both, that we're both of us. Both of us are. We work well together. We like a team, and I had that same relationship with my mom. <laughs> Did you hear her? With her, it's just it's just a good time. We laugh a lot. I will see. <laughs> it's enjoyable. It, it really is. I don't know if a lot of people can say that about a business. With this mother and daughter team started as just a hobby, turned into a legitimate business in November 2016. My it was mom, mostly, yeah, yeah. well, it was kind of most of us, both of us together, because she always did want to do a business. And she wanted to do cupcakes, and I hated cupcakes. <laughs> Too much work. <laughs> One day she made scones. So I got to thinking about it. Scone, that's not something, that's something easy. <laughs> I would have to work real hard and let her do most of the work. Yeah. And wasn't cupcakes. <laughs> and I says, why don't we make scones? She said, oh, yes. Scones. And she said, well, what are we going to call it? I said, well, let's make it two ladies on a scone. That's as simple as that. Yeah. That was it. A majority of their business is done online. Customers purchase the scones through their website. When we opened the business, I was explaining to my mother, I said, I truly believe we should do a website because everything now is on online and a lot of these businesses are starting online. Now, the two of them wake up early six days a week and whip up dozens of freshly baked scones. It's all done in my kitchen. We start at 4 a.m. It's early in the morning, but fortunately, Elle doesn't have much of a commute to work. Well, I have to walk at least about 20 steps from my house over to the to my job. Yeah. Exactly. And you know she's late sometimes, too. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Good morning. Good morning. How you doing? I'm doing OK. That's good. It's all prepped. It's all ready to go. I mean, we, we're hair netted. We're aproned down. We're kind of funny looking at 4 in the morning. <laughs> Real funny looking. Yeah. <laughs> They're not like a typical scone. You can't build a house out of them. The ordinary stone, some people buy, they're so hard. Ours is more like, I don't know, it has a different texture to it. It's almost flaky and it's yeah. buttery. When you bite into it, you really, you know what you're eating. If you bite in the banana, you can taste it, because when I'm, you know, cutting the dough, you have pieces of banana in there. It's not anything artificially added. Everything is fresh, mm -hmm. right? You try to keep it simple. Shortly after the scones are made, they're boxed and ready to head out the door. Every morning, six days a week, we deliver. Some of the scones are dropped off at the post office for their online customers to be shipped all across the U.S. <laughs> the remaining scones are delivered to Giacomo's, a local coffee joint that offers them to their customers. I really like the fact that we're doing local businesses because we're all helping each other out. Thank you. You're welcome. You have a great day. You as well. Bye-bye. Right, Bye. While they're out and about, they usually make a trip to the grocery store to pick up fresh ingredients. I know we have to get strawberries, right? Strawberries. Okay, let's do that first. All right. We're in the about store. twice a week. No, three, Sometimes no. three days a week. No, sometimes about three. Four days a week. <laughs> yeah. Five no, days there a week. There you go. We're in the store all the time. I think that'll be good. You driving that cart like you out on the Highway 99? Uh, yeah. The scones are certainly keeping them busy. It's brought much more than what I ever anticipated it to bring. As for what the future holds for these two ladies and their scones? Whenever I leave the picture, it's something she can still carry on. Yeah, but then it wouldn't be any fun. No, it wouldn't be any fun. It wouldn't be any fun then. I don't want to think about that, but that, that would be, you know, when that does happen, I would really have to think about how I would do it, because right now it's fun. We're, yeah, we're having it's a blast. Fun. Yeah. They're in no hurry to grow this business quickly. For now, they're simply enjoying being in the moment and seeing where it takes them.
She's given me a new approach to business. She's trying to get me to, to understand, let this do its own little thing, and she's been 100% right. I've learned that if the slower it goes, the larger it'll grow. Just hang in there and you reap the rewards of just doing it slow. Okay. We're doing it by word of mouth. Giacomo's came, mm -hmm. and now you're here. And we haven't solicited any of these things. And with us, we sure, we could use the money, but that's not the main thing now. We're making memories every day. And I want to look back at fond memories wherever this business goes. Well, Mom, went well. Another order down. Until tomorrow. Same time, same place. <laughs>On July 1st, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railway Act into law. The act provided federal government support for the building of a transcontinental railroad that would link California with the East. It also authorized the creation of two companies to build the railroad, the Central Pacific in the West and the Union Pacific in the Midwest. The building of the Transcontinental Railroad became a race because that government subsidy was involved. It's the only reason it happened. And so these companies that were incorporated, the Union Pacific Railroad building from the east to the west, the Central Pacific Railroad incorporated for the purpose of building from the west to the east, were competing to lay as much track as possible. This mural on display at the Sacramento Valley train station depicts the Central Pacific's groundbreaking ceremony which took place at Sacramento's Front and K Streets on January 8, 1863. The building of the Transcontinental Railroad was a mammoth undertaking that would take six and a half years to complete. At the height of construction, the project would employ more than 12,000 laborers, 90% of them Chinese. The two lines met at Promontory Point, Utah, and on May 10, 1869, Leland Stanford, governor of California and president of the Central Pacific Railroad, used a silver hammer to drive in a ceremonial final spike made of gold to signify the joining of the East and the West forever. Much of what we know about the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, we know because of one man, photographer Alfred A. Hart. Working for the Central Pacific, Hart documented the construction of the railroad in stereo 3D photography. Hart, although inexperienced, went out and captured not only the shots that detailed the different aspects of building the Transcontinental Railroad, but really captured the great grandeur and beauty of those spaces, even as they were being altered. Hart's photos have been displayed in museums across the country, including the Crocker Museum, and are now housed permanently at the California State Library. In 1969, it took a team of engineers, scientists, and astronauts to successfully land the Apollo 11 lunar module on the moon. This next story chronicles the efforts of another team to save and restore NASA's mission control 50 years later. 20 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some It was just after 3 p.m. in Houston. Two and a half down. Buzz Aldrin and down. Neil Armstrong were rapidly Four descending forward. to the lunar surface. Four forward, drift into the right a little. At the Johnson Three. Space Center, scratchy radio transmissions seconds. were relayed around the world and put millions, probably billions, of anxious people on the edge of their seats. Contact light. At 17 minutes past the hour. Okay, engine stop. APA at a decent. The wait ended. Boat control, both auto, decent engine command override off. Engine arm off. We copy it down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. It was an almost impossible journey 
that began with a presidential order and the work of tens of thousands of men and women all over the U.S. Controllers in mission control had little time to celebrate. They still had three men to bring home. Fast forward 30 years, and this special room had aged. A new control room built. The power to the early Apollo consoles shut off, the dust already settling. When they shut it down, it had, um, you know, they literally just got up and walked out. It was dark, it was dusty. I mean, it hurt me to, to see that. It would appear this historic place, this national landmark, was destined to just rot away. But the men that took us to the moon had other ideas and new dreams for this special place. The flight controllers, they've referred to this as their cathedral. Great now. Suddenly, a new team sprang to life, taking on a new mission. We're doing our best to honor the heroes that were in this room. I still have a, a goosebump feeling every time I walk into this building. This new team is saving history, saving mission control. In a simple Kansas warehouse, those dreams are being rekindled and space history is being saved. It's important for people to see what it took for us to put man on the moon. The very tools that got us to the moon are being brought back to life. These are the historic mission control consoles from Building 30 down in Houston. If anybody has seen the movie Apollo 13 and you see the room that the film takes place in, these are the actual consoles from that room. Here in Hutchinson, Kansas, just outside Wichita, a unique team of engineers and craftsmen is rebuilding the control consoles that sent Apollo to the moon. We are helping Houston Johnson Space Center restore them back to the Apollo era. Soon, its monitors will flash back to life and lights flicker on like the old, heady days of the moon missions. I remember this, yeah, this is all uh, history in my, my era. <laughs> Don Ike was just a nine-year-old kid during the Apollo 11 flight. Now, he's preserving a major piece of that historic mission. This group, called Spaceworks, is part of the Cosmosphere Air and Space Museum. With the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 fast approaching, they are crafting new switches, lights, and monitors, and cleaning up the old consoles. And they brought the rebuilt space consoles back home, here to Houston. There's a wild buzz at the loading dock as they come off the truck, through the doors, up the freight elevator, and down the last long hallway. This is a journey back to the cathedral. Up wooden ramps, onto the old risers. Mission control slowly fills up again. That's plenty. Everywhere you see people going at it. Here is that. Electricians and technicians jump right in to start hooking up the consoles, pulling wires and cables, and crawling under the old risers. Historical architects have worked years on things like carpet, ceiling tiles, wallpaper, and artifacts. If it's not authentic, if you don't know it was in the room, you shouldn't put it in the room. You've got to have the evidence to back it up. Wallpaper, we found somebody removed a fire extinguisher off the wall. The color is, is pretty close. They cleaned the uh, wallpaper before the color matched it. And that's kind of what we did here. We want to leave kind of a window in time and let people see what the wallpaper really was back in 1960. Chief architect David Buchik and historian and cultural resource expert Adam Graves have become obsessed with details. A lot of mysteries, a lot of things were removed from the room um, during the shuttle program. The wallpaper, the carpet, the ceiling tiles were all removed. A big challenge we had was to research what these things were like uh, during the, when the first moon landing occurred. We're creating July 20th, where the, the descent and landing, um, which is a big moment the eagle has landed. 
For nearly four years, they have studied the old room and are trying to put it back together exactly the way it was at the very moment of the moon landing. It's here in Building 30 where so much American history was made. And it's here where Mission Control comes back to life. The challenge is to make new look old. So they study film and photographs from that day. We did a frame by frame search through 16 millimeter film that was taken on the day of the moon landing. We were able to identify all of the objects that we needed in the room. We inventory documented down to every button. And perhaps most importantly, they talked to the old controllers. They got some of those old relics to hang around and be consultants on it, just and try to help with what we remember. We interviewed them at their consoles. When we did the interviews, that's when we learned a lot about what these folks were doing with these consoles, what their particular mission was, what was on their screen. And what kind of documents, maps, if they, what they drank, what they smoked. And yes, apparently they allowed smoking in the control room then. There's the ashtrays. Remember, that was a half century ago times were very different. They aren't just ashtrays, they're cultural history that tell the story of mission control. Uh, they said that sometimes in this room you really couldn't even see the screens that the smoke was that thick. The crews went to great lengths to first find evidence of the cigarettes. I remember when we first found our first one in the sim control room after we removed the consoles in there and it's like, oh, there's a cigarette, we gotta keep it. And to find old period ashtrays, exactly like the ones in the films and photos. So Delaney and the others lived long hours on eBay. All of a sudden that really ugly brown and yellow mug that you couldn't find anywhere would show up on eBay and I couldn't click fast enough to get it. And about the smoking, it seems to be the one area where some of the controllers have memory lapses. They were buying eight inch ashtrays that were oversized for what they were actually doing, which was sitting here and chain smoking. The interviews were funny because, you know, a guy would tell you he didn't smoke and you know in a video you saw him smoking like a chimney. So keeping true to the history of July 20th, the place will be filled up with ashtrays, books, coat racks, headsets, staplers, hole punches, old, uncomfortable government issue chairs, and some of the ugliest coffee mugs you'll find anywhere. And there's a plastic coffee cup with burlap inside the plastic. It, there's, there's nothing nice about it. It's just burlap inside of a plastic coffee cup. But it was in this room on that day at that moment, and we had to identify it, find it, purchase it, and bring, we're bringing it back. And most importantly, they're bringing back many of the Apollo controllers to view the progress. How are you doing, sir? Good to see you again. More than any other group, these guys will know if the team got it right. This restoration effort, this labor of love, had taken years. Every movement, the floors, the ceilings, the consoles captured and documented by NASA photographers. Down to the last hours, the team installs the phones, hangs the maps. The big screen projectors fire up at the front of the room, just like 50 years ago. And just down the way, there are those ugly coffee mugs and the eight inch ashtrays. All is back to normal at Mission Control. As the restoration nears completion, the curious veterans of Apollo trickle in to check on things. Ed Fendel was assistant flight director under Gene Kranz. Both have been a big part of this restoration project, along with NASA Historic Preservation Officer Sandra Tetley. They did a great job. Gene Kranz and Ed Fendel were the two that really spearheaded the, the push to have it restored. Well, it looks like it used to look. Exactly. It looks okay. really good. Yeah. Really good. This place meant a lot to them. They spent a lot of time away from families. They, they spent a lot of time together here, you know, going through some pretty amazing moments and heroic moments and difficult moments and, and seeing, the, seeing their looks um, really get you every time. It just it really looks original and, and uh, brings back a lot of memories. Their eyes get really wide. Uh, it takes them back. And, and you, so you, you begin to sense that emotion. You know that you're connecting to them because they're starting to see the room animated again. When you heard, when you heard Lola, you know, when you heard 60 seconds. 60 seconds. And then 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Forward. She said, he, I said, he really needs to. Sit it down. <laughs> he sat down and then when I heard uh, Buzz call, we get picking up a little bit of dust. 
There's no doubt. For a long time, emotions will run raw in this special place, this cathedral, because here in Houston, they are saving history, saving a living snapshot of mission control from that incredible July day back in 1969. We copy you down, Eagle. Listen, uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Still ahead, an innovative school lunch program that sources fresh ingredients from local farmers. As KVIE celebrates its 60th anniversary, we've been combing through some of the tens of thousands of stories in our archives, many of which only exist on old videotapes we don't use anymore. Well, some of those stories are timeless, and others are just fun to watch to see how things were back in the good old days. We thought we'd share some with you. So from the vault, here's the first story from the very first episode of California Heartland from 1996. Our good friend, the late George Redding, introduces Vanishing Farmland, which features local peach farmer and author, David Moss Masamoto. Hello, I'm George Redding, and welcome to the premiere of California Heartland a new series about the generous earth of the Golden State and the people who work it. Each week, we'll take you to their farms and ranches and discover how they put food on the tables of not only our country, but the entire world. We begin with a quiz. What do you think is the biggest threat to agriculture in California? Flood, droughts, bed flies? No, but here's a clue. Just 45 years ago, the most productive farmland in America went from open fields to what we now call Greater Los Angeles. The real threat to agriculture is concrete, strip malls, and three-bedroom homes. The surging population of California is washing across our farmlands in the form of urbanization. When farmland is lost, especially prime farmland, it could never be replaced. David Moss Masamoto, a third-generation Japanese-American farmer, grows grapes and peaches on 80 acres in the Central Valley. The manicured lawns and two garage houses of Greater Fresno are marching in his direction. A farmer and a writer, Masamoto's award-winning book, Epitaph for a Peach, celebrates country life and expresses concern about its destiny. But his fields, only a short drive from Fresno, are inviting to developers and commuters. What you see here is an abandoned fig orchard with a housing development right on the other side. The irony is that in a few years, this will become houses, and the developer may use the name Fig Orchard Estates as if it's a selling point to keep that rural theme with houses. Hold on, you say? Why the anxiety about urban sprawl? We have a lot of vacant space in California and throughout the West. It's not going to run out. There's a big difference in the quality of land. There's prime farmland, and that's, if you look around, it's land that's been farmed for generations. That land was farmed for generations because it was good land. It's rich land, and it can't be, uh, it can't be replaced. Moss allocates land on his farm for a small stand of the exotic Suncrest peaches, so rich and tasty and full of juice that they don't have the shelf life required by supermarkets. They are too exotic for mass production and shipping. He celebrated these anachronisms of rural America in his book. Suncrest is one of the last remaining truly juicy peaches. When you wash that treasure under a stream of cooling water, your fingertips instinctively search for that gushy side of the fruit. Then you sink your teeth into the flesh and the juices trickle down your cheeks and dangle on your chin. This is a real bite a primal act, a magical sensory celebration announcing that summer has arrived. Peaches mean something very special to me, and like all farms, because this orchard produces jobs, it produces livelihood for the community to share in. One acre of my peaches will produce anywhere from five to $10,000 of gross income that goes back into the community that supports my neighbors, farm workers, and people in the farming region. What's being done to protect California's farmland? North of San Francisco, the Marin Agricultural Land Trust has just preserved 
some 25,000 acres of dairy farms and ranch lands from urban encroachment. Sonoma County is also actively protecting farmland. And in the Central Valley, the American Farmland Trust is urging that important farmlands be set aside as agricultural reserves. There's different ways that farmland and houses can be good neighbors, but it takes planning, not this kind of abrupt nature of development stuck next to farmland. I try to be optimistic about urbanization occurring in farmland areas because I want to believe that people will do the right thing. And part of that is what I write about, stories about people working the land, having faith in the land, believing in the land, and hopefully developing good neighbors that understand that passion that we have and respect that passion so that we can also be part of a community and be good neighbors too. When I was growing up, there were a lot more farmers in the United States. Most people lived on a farm or they had an uncle or a grandfather, somebody that was connected with agriculture. And that's not true today. Obviously food is what composes our body and makes us healthy. And so I think it's important that we understand how food grows, where it comes from and all the processes and, and why eating certain things is, is healthy. This is not just a bean, it's the seed for the yeah. next generation. And so, Gerald uh, Fry is the owner of Moore Fry Ranch, a family farming operation based in Lodi. These the heirloom well, beans are one of their signature plant. products, and soon they'll be dished up for students in the Lodi Unified School District, thanks to the efforts of Zenobia Barlow and the Center for Eco Literacy. There's nearly one billion meals served in schools in the state of California annually, so there's huge potential for feeding children healthy food. The center is working with 71 school districts in California to serve locally grown food one day a week, a campaign called California Thursdays. In San Diego, for example, I think they have a, at least 212 campuses and they're serving antibiotic free chili lime, drumsticks and fresh vegetables. In Monterey, they have a bay to tray program. And so instead of kids eating Pollock from Alaska, they're eating local Monterey raised fish in fish tacos. In Oakland, they're serving a whole wheat pasta with kale and chorizo. And that kale is from Alba Organics. And here at Lodi High School, the heirloom beans grown by Moore Fry Ranch in Lodi are being turned into a hearty pasta fagioli dish. So with the beans, when they, they come to us, like this, a raw product, and we have to soak them overnight. It's very important to soak them or the quality doesn't come out as good. So when we started California Thursdays and cooking from scratch, the kitchen staff were a little has hesitant and unsure um, about what was gonna be required to cook. It was a little bit of a transition for our staff, but once they could see the quality difference between a canned bean and a fresh bean, and how beautiful these beans are, it really just got them excited about cooking and adding and introducing the students to that new product. I think it's great. Um, so many of our students don't get to eat the fresh food like this because they can't afford it. So I think it's wonderful that we can offer these products to the kids. Very good. I can't stop eating it. <laughs> the Lodi Unified School District began the transition to fresher, more local food a few years ago. Along with the beans, they're now serving hot dogs made in Lodi and Sloppy Joe's using California beef. They found the biggest hurdle was bringing back kitchen equipment that had been removed, as well as training the staff to cook from scratch. Traditionally, uh, you know, if you looked at 50 years ago, freshly prepared meals were the norm, but as the processed food and fast food convention occurred across the country, schools stopped building kitchens and started serving heat and thaw meals. And so this is the resurgence of sort of the old fashioned way of cooking real food for real kids. And real kids say they can taste the difference. Today I ate some bread with this wonderful soup. It had beans in it. It's really good and it's very healthy for you. You know, they're like brown and stuff, so it has a good flavor, especially with all the spices, make it better. So all around it's pretty good soup. 
Well, like in elementary school, we didn't really have this, and it was more bland, and then now it's not as bland, and it's more diverse. It's not just like hamburgers and pizza. It's like bean soup and sloppy joes. It wakes me up more. I feel like I was saying, like, I, I used to, like, a few years ago, I'd fall asleep in class all the time, and now, like, after lunch, I'm, like, awake and ready. It's probably a little bit better to, like, eat healthy, so, like, hearing that things, like, come from, like, out of our backyard, like, it could come from right out of our backyard, it's kind of cool to think about that. Lodi Unified also put in self-serve salad bars at all their schools, offering students fruits and veggies that are 85% California grown. We get our Arcadian mix or our salad mix from the Salinas Valley. We have strawberries that have been grown right here um, close to Watsonville. It is all sourced here that we, can, that we can get during season. The fresh produce is not that much more expensive to bring it in local. The beans, you were on a pound per pound basis, but by the time I add in all the additional costs, it really isn't that much of a difference um, for us. Maybe a few cents on a meal, but it's well worth it. I like to know that the food that I eat is fresh and not come from a company and processed and just left in a can and shipped. I like to know that's fresh. Thank you. The 71 school districts in our network are examples of people who are innovating and making commitments to do this in large or small ways. My advice for other districts would be for them to start small if they're looking to introduce local foods or to be a partner within the California Thursdays initiative. And by doing that, they don't have to necessarily do the whole plate, but look at one item or a produce that they can bring in or a farm that's close by. They may not be able to do their entire district, but they can start it with one school and then expand from there and not be afraid of it because the families, the students, your staff really connect with knowing where their food comes from. Still to come, a preview of the first episode of our new series, The Journey. Returning to the beloved Sacramento Ballet after almost 20 years, new artistic director Amy Seiwert shares her vision of dance and her role in the organization in her own words. things on the planet that are difficult to put into words and to me dance and music can fill the spaces that sometimes words cannot. What I want to do is to challenge people's preconceptions of what ballet is. This is a phenomenal organization. Over 60 years in this community, building dancers, building audiences. It's pretty fantastic to think that I am running the company that I used to dance for. I've always wanted to direct. I have wanted to do that since I was a young dancer. I felt like I'd been training my whole life for this job, and that felt good. So I made a World Premiere Nutcracker this year, which is the biggest artistic project I'd ever taken on. People have very strong opinions about Nutcracker. It's a very intimidating thing to step into. But, you know, as a choreographer, you want to put your stamp on something. So being able to do that was huge. I actually started hearing the music differently. Dance is the physical embodiment of the music, so if I can take whatever I'm hearing, find the intention to it, and put it into physical form, it's about the environment we create in the studio. It's about the support these artists have for each other and what they create every day. Having dancers who are willing to take the leap with you is essential. I talk with the dancers often about um, don't chase the dragon. You had, a, you had a great show last night. Don't try to recreate it. What's going to be new tonight? How do you go somewhere else? Where else can you explore? When you're creating like that, it feels 
effortless. You're not struggling, you're in your creative zone. It's just crazy because some days it all just works and some days it doesn't. There's a saying that if everything you do works, you're not trying hard enough. Um, so you need to be able to create and fail because you might learn something incredibly valuable that takes you to the next place that you can't get to without that little failure. We're excited to be launching a new limited local series called The Journey that will be hosted by Rob Stewart. Each episode celebrates the personal journey of a leader in our community, highlighting who they are, what they've accomplished, and the journey that got them to where they are now. Here's a first look at the premiere episode that features Sacramento River Cats owner, Susan Savage. On the journey, one of Sacramento's most influential women, a top executive in the country in minor league baseball today. I'm Susan. Susan Savage owner of the Sacramento River Cats baseball team is at the top of her game. But away from sports, life hasn't been just a field of dreams. For the first time, Susan Savage shares her personal story like never before. We don't go through the same thing, but we have the same pain. The shocking loss of the love of her life, the near drowning of her youngest son, and the life lessons she will bravely share in hopes of helping you. I think everybody has a story, everybody, worth listening to. You are unconsciously courageous. Do you believe that? I'm sitting here. What must be shared from the journey of Susan Savage. Come on in, this is my office. This is nice, Susan. And Thank you know you. what? This is really where you work. You're not just the owner. You run this place, and that's rare. Well, it's probably rare to have a working owner. Mm -hmm. Particularly a woman. Yes, definitely. Susan Savage is savvy and smart. The Savage name is synonymous with Sacramento sports and has been for two decades. The year was 2000 when Susan's late husband, Art Savage, brought the Rivercats franchise to the capital of California with this graceful stadium nestled along the Sacramento River. It's even called the crown jewel of ballparks in minor league baseball. There are more than 70 games a year Susan looks at each game as if she were throwing a party for 14,000 people. The Rivercats earning the title of best ticket sales and highest attendance figures of any team in Triple A baseball. You have to make some pretty tough decisions in here too. It's not all fun and games. This is hard. This is hard business. I mean, your job is to make sure every single thing here runs smoothly. Everything, and I wonder if fans know that. It's on your shoulders. It is, but I think, you know, any leader, I would hope, would want to surround themselves with really good people because that's the key, you know. Uh, one thing I did learn is I can't do all this myself. That isn't going to work. And so um, teamwork on the field is crucial, and teamwork in any organization really is crucial. That team took a crushing blow in 2009. It was a Saturday morning. Susan and Art had just been at the game the night before and with much to celebrate. Art had battled cancer, but was 18 months cancer free, not a tumor in his body. Doctors declared him healthy, but something tragically went wrong. Susan and Art were alone at home when Art suddenly died. Susan becomes owner of the River Cats and in her mourning steps up to the plate to save her team 
and her family. There were so many times that I wanted to ask Art, you know, what should I do? And there was no Art to ask, and it was very difficult. Was this his office? Yes. Susan Savage has an undeniable presence of strength. And as you're about to see, it's a strength she would cling to when life throws you a curveball time and time again. I can feel just the change in your energy when we talk about that because that was such a heavy, heavy mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. But look at you now. Well, there was a lot of change, you know. A lot of life mm -hmm. has happened between then and now. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to walk in here today? I think about how Art would feel, and I think he would be very proud of, uh, of all of us, the whole family, Jeff and Brent and myself. I think he would, I think he would be happy with what's happened. I think he would say, girl, you hit a home run. <laughs> that would be nice. That would make me feel really good. Download the free PBS video app to stream all your favorite KVIE programs whenever, wherever, on your phone, computer, or TV. I'm Michael Sanford. It's been a pleasure being part of your Sunday. We hope you've enjoyed today's stories and that you'll be back next week for another episode of Sunday Stories. Until then, have a great week.